Hey guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. Super Talk 1270. Town on Super Talk 1270. Talk of the Town. Brought to you by Big Boy. Just get in line. It moves fast. Dakota Pharmacy and Dakota Natural Health Center. We're here to help you stay well. Trademark Realty. Peak Automotive and Service. And Silver Ranch. You're tuned to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Bach, along with Jason Spees from The Crude Life. You can catch Crude Life Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. right here on Super Talk 1270. We're going to run through a little bit of uh, year in review, some of the interviews that uh, Jason has had and uh, myself as well over the, the course of the year, uh, both on The Crude Life and on uh, Wattage Wednesday on Super Talk 1270's Talk of the Town. And a quick update on the roads, uh, conditions around Bismarck Mandan, extremely icy. Uh, the main thoroughfares fairly okay. You get into the residential neighborhoods, parking lots, sidewalks, extremely slippery, so do uh, be uh, very cautious this morning. As far as the roadways, uh, ice through uh, east of uh, Bismarck over in the uh, Steel area. I-94 is icy all the way until uh, west of Mandan, also uh, up until uh, Washburn on I-90 or on US-83, also slippery this morning. Uh, extremely icy from Fargo to Steele. Also I-94 um, for uh, the rest of the way. Um, slick conditions. You get out towards Dickinson uh, and uh, winter driving conditions. Uh, roads look pretty good in the northwest corner of the state. Uh, also uh, I-29 from Fargo to the Canadian border, extremely icy as well. We do have one patch of uh, roadway, uh, an area with blocked roads, so no travel north of Jamestown to north of Valley City. A little bit working in uh, a west-northwest uh, or uh, west-northeast um, Direction So the roads up there, uh, including part of Highway 200, closed this morning as well. We'll keep you up to date with all the latest travel alerts. And uh, as they come in this morning, uh, some snow down in the southeastern part of the state as well. And we'll track that for you this morning. South Dakota getting a, a pretty good snowstorm uh, last night into today as well. Uh, this is Talk of the Town on Super Doc 1270. I'm Steve Bach along with Jason Spies from The Crude Life. Good morning, Jason. You have a good Christmas, my friend. Good morning. Happy holidays to you. I uh, had a wonderful Christmas, and uh, it turned into a white Christmas, which, um, you know, it was kind of nice, although it, the weather wasn't um, as uh, vertical as I would like. I don't like, like horizontal snow. I, I, I can tolerate vertical snow, but <laughs> horizontal snow, and I got a little issue with that. And wet horizontal snow was the trifecta of what I don't want, which is what we're experiencing right now. <laughs> so, yeah. So, How you doing, man? Not bad. I, kind of a low key Christmas this year. Ish. Ish. Spent a lot of time with the puppies. Ish, the the ish, ice huh? yesterday and today and the day before. It's like, um, you know how difficult it is for humans to walk on ice, right? Well, try taking a puppy out. <laughs> Even with four, four paw drive, it, it just does not work. Puppies were not you know, happy. One of the things we did this last week on a weekend review, which I believe we're going to have coming up here in the next segment as we kind of celebrate a few of the different um, interviews throughout the past year and everything like that, is with uh, uh, Dwayne Ferris. He does uh, Black Creek Canine Pipe Inspections. And, you know, his job has really transformed. Of course, we've had him on the program here with Talk of the Town. And the working dogs are some of the more underrated and underutilized parts of industry. And Dwayne, you know, he does the pipeline sniffing. Of course, he's expanded into narcotics and drug sniffing dogs at some of the, the workplace sites and um, 
it's a it's a trip when you talk to him a few times uh, off the record about when he gets helicoptered into a offshore oil rig. Um, he's got even got some NDAs he has to sign, so he can't even talk really about that publicly on some of the things. So it's rather interesting, Steve. Well, and uh, you know we've had multiple dog people on uh, on the program as far as training service dogs and working dogs uh, when it comes mm-hmm. to the oil and gas industry and, and some of the other nuances that our animal friends, our four-legged friends, can do better than technology. I mean, kick it old school. Why not? The the Bloodhound and the Malinois, Malinois and uh, the German Shepherds and even Labs are coming in at a higher uh, percentage rate of uh, accuracy than any robot we have on the market right now. So, you know, in the oil and gas industry, we invest a lot into automation. We invest a lot into software. And a lot of that is really wasted. Not a lot of waste goes into the working dogs. In fact, those dogs love to work. When all the uh, millennials are trying to get out of work, the dogs are trying to get into work, okay? So rather than maybe give millions of dollars more to people that don't want to work, you know, if if we're going to be political in the last week of the year, yeah, let's look at the people who want to work, and some of those people happen to have dogs. And so one of the things that we really do pride ourselves with, let me rephrase that. One of the things that we wear as a badge of honor at the Crude Life, because remember, pride is one of the seven deadly sins. One of the things that we honor ourselves with at the Crude Life is our ability to talk about different topics that are outside of the echo chamber, Steve. And that's what we do to progress a lot of thought. And I believe the working dogs are going to see a real good place next year because it's good for PR. It's very good for their ESG score. And I tell you what, I haven't met anybody who really, you know, doesn't like a dog. I mean, there are people who are afraid of dogs. Well, wait, wait, wait a minute. So what you're telling me is, is I'm going to ask you this in all seriousness. Uh, yeah. Seriousness, it, 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 because maybe it's going by volume, but what you're saying is dogs are good for your ESG score, so unlike cows, dogs don't fart? Not as much. No. Okay, so no, they don't, so volume they matters don't when it comes to your ESG stomach. score. Yeah, do- dogs are a canine. <laughs> they don't have as much gas with the with, with the grass and the four stomachs. Steve. So I, I so, can't, yeah, I, yeah, so blaming the dog yeah. doesn't work, right? Right, and you know, if we can get the pigs to work and find some truffles, you know, we'd be we'd be doing okay. High on the well, high. Actually, I'll be honest. To be perfectly honest, you know, when you talk about the cow, I I, I truly believe a lot of this is is being driven to make the cow more a part of our society than we've ever thought. And what I mean by that is, just go to India. That's not a religious. You know, attachment to the cow. That is a cultural attachment to the cow, to where the cow just takes in grass and water and gives you milk, gives you butter, gives you ghee, gives you yogurt. The cow gives back so much to society, gives you manure for your plants to grow, that the Indian culture, they don't eat the cow. If you notice, you if you go to an Indian restaurant, I, I don't think I've ever seen one. Chicken and pork. That has, what's that? Chicken and pork. Mostly right. chicken. Uh, mo- most seafood and chicken, yeah. mostly. Yeah, seafood and chicken mostly. I don't even see a lot of pork. You see goat, but you don't see a lot of pork even. Because uh, a lot of pork is a, f- a filthy animal according to a lot of uh, religious. Okay, so so I I only asked that question tongue in cheek yeah. to a certain degree because the, the real place I wanted to go with it was when you're looking at an ESG score and mm-hmm. people get hung up on oh we got to get rid of cattle and livestock and and because of the the methane produced by cow farts it, it's <laughs> it's it, it's part of the green agenda but and we should put this by but the do way, they in factor the in do they factor in what comes back because there's an input and there's an output and mm-hmm. when you factor all the things that come out of animal agriculture far outweighs anything that's put into it or anything that is a byproduct is is the methane side of it you have to factor in what comes out of that. 
I don't. I have never seen an ESG report. I've never seen anybody who is going down the rabbit hole of cow farts that has gone. Yeah, but they also provide this, 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 this and this. Okay, there's an offset. There's an ROI. There's a return on that investment. Okay, you get a little methane, but you get all of this stuff. I've never seen that factored into an ESG report. So if we were to do one. It would be so complex that it would probably need 14 quantum computers in order to operate it, Steve. I mean, because when you talk about the current, we'll just take the cow industry, the livestock industry. We don't even have to take the dairy industry. Just take the livestock industry, right? So when we take a look at that, how much of that now is reliant on corn? How much of that is reliant on soy? How much of that is reliant on GMO? So if we now we have to layer in GMO, so that now we got to tie it to NDSU. So now if you're against anything to do with the current method and the current movement that the ag industry is going down, well now you're against NDSU. You see how this works, Steve? Oh yeah. You see how this works? <laughs> but people and don't always so connect all now, the dots. You have to connect all the dots. But but it goes even a step further, because if you're against the current livestock industry well then you're against ethanol too so now you got ethanol that you got to go against and now apparently you got to go against uh, a lot of um oil and gas companies because they're tied in with uh with, with ethanol through the carbon sequestration so the the movements become so layered that it's next to impossible to have an intelligent conversation with someone it's really difficult it's to the point to where, and I give this example a lot when I was dealing with job service in North Dakota, and I literally showed the worker how to use chat GTP with, a, with the artificial intelligence after they got done telling me artificial intelligence wasn't anything to worry about in 2023. I showed them how easy artificial intelligence works by having it write me a paper. And they, they scoffed and did that wrist flip and walked away. This is your leadership right now. And this is what's happening. So that, That's a great place to take a break. And I want to come back and yep. talk about, you know, because the other part of that is, well, at the end of the day, then you just have the Bill Gateses of the world that just buy up all the ag land and stop producing off of that agriculture land as well. Because bigger picture, we can get into the population control and all that down the road. But um Coming up at the bottom of the hour, going, great segue from AI and Chad GPT and the artificial intelligence. We're going to talk with Marlo Anderson coming up at the bottom of the hour, our guru of geek. Uh, we're talking with Jason Spees, my co-host for Wattage Wednesday on Talk of the Town on Super Talk 12. Supply. Super Talk. Plato's Closet in West Ashley and North Charleston are springing up cash. Just sell us your gently used warm weather styles like tees, shorts, sandals, and more. We're paying cash on the spot for gently used spring styles for guys and girls. Support sustainable fashion. This spring, do your thing and recycle the spring-inspired clothes, shoes, and accessories that are just hanging in your closet for cash on the spot. Let your spring clothes bloom into cash at Plato's Closet. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. You're tuned to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Bach along with Jason Spees from The Crude Life. You can catch Crude Life each and every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. right here on Super Talk 1270. And we're talking about the agriculture intersection uh, when it comes to ESG and energy. And, uh, oh, Marlo Anderson just showed up. Oh, we're, we, we got a little special something coming up at the bottom of the hour, so that'll be fun, too. Uh, you can celebrate every day. Oh, no, we can. In we energy. Can do it. Yeah, we can preview. You, yeah, in so energy. We, we want to do a um, get your calendar ready for energy-themed days. So since we have the heavyweight of the nation right in our backyard in Bismarck, North Dakota. Did you just call Marlo fat? No, I'm heavyweight as in champion. Oh, he's a, okay, you know, he's okay. The, he's just... the uh, Evander <laughs> Holyfield with, with two ears champion, not, well, not one well, ear. Well, you, said, you said the heavyweights. I, I'm like, wait a yeah. minute, are you talking about Marlo? It's... Well, I know he's a little bit sensitive well, you, around Christmas. Well, you know this body was built on bagels, so. <laughs> body by bagels. Body built by bagels, Marlo Anderson. <laughs> That's a... 
<laughs> oh, boy. You know, Marlo, we were talking about a variety of different things here, kind of year in review, and, um, you know, which is great because now with you, we get to look ahead for 2024 in the world of energy. But you and I did a kind of a impromptu, we kind of got thrown in together, and, and we had a very good talk, I remember, around this time last year about the emergence of artificial intelligence. And I tell you what, if I were to say, in you know what 2023 was probably defined by it would probably be artificial intelligence marlo you know it's interesting today is the one year anniversary of chat gpt going public yeah it's we just, talked we talked about that it, last it is year. one year today imagine how the world has changed in a year just by that going public it's incredible i tell you what i just got an email on my year in review type of things. And Chad GTP blew everything out of the water in terms of uh, year in review with um, these types of things. I'm, I'm trying to find it. So I'm, Did that score higher the, than, than granny porn? Because I, I heard about right. that this morning as well. That is my favorite year in review stat. We will be doing a story at ESGU.org. ESGU.org. I have no response yeah. to that. <laughs> there, there is none. Gilf, Zero. Gilf and granny porn was the number one search on Pornhub. And that is a story too hot not to handle. <laughs> but we'll leave that for uh, wow. ESG University. <laughs> I actually volunteered to be here today. Yeah, Are you, you serious? Yeah, you can't make this stuff up. You just can't. Hey, Marlo. Wow. Yeah. I learned a new word today, too. It's called gills. I busted out loud laughing when I heard that. <laughs> it's an educational program. It is. But you'll have to go to ESGU to find out what that education okay. might be. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hey, at least you got your coffee, right? I did get my coffee. Yeah, you got your coffee. That's so, right. So Chad GPT, one year old today, and and um, Jason and I talk about the energy side of stuff quite often, um, and, and the new technology. You're on the technology side of new technology, and I found it interesting over this last year, where the intersection of artificial intelligence and the intersection of energy has. Th- I don't know if they've quite gotten there yet, but it's getting there quickly. When, when you take a look at the innovation that gets spawned by artificial intelligence and layer that over in any industry, if you want to talk medical, if you want to talk energy, if you there's an intersection. I don't think we've quite peaked yet or found that intersection on the energy side of stuff. Well, I would say that um, I'm, and, and I'm not as versed in energy like Jason and you are, Steve. But but uh, uh, the first thing that comes to mind for me is the grid and the ability to forecast, um, to look at a weather model, for example, and then determine is, is Texas going to need more energy in two days than they normally do. And you're able to start doing the things that you need to do. AI can do that. They can actually start making those switches uh, a lot faster than what a, what a human can do, you know. That may be good, may be bad. I know that, uh, you know, even in, in train speak, I've talked to a few people that run trains, so to speak, and they're using, you know, trying to use artificial intelligence to forecast the movement of trains and things. And, and they were working on it for a while. They pulled back a little bit because they realized that there's some challenges there. But it's, these things are moving forward quickly. And Well, and I grew up in a railroad family, and, and whether it's the passenger side of things or if it is the freight side of things, railroads are logistics companies. Yep. And they work on very tight timetables. Time is money to railroads, whether it's the passenger or the freight side yep. of things. So being able to augment that through artificial intelligence and make those connections, you take a look at a switchyard in a, in a large uh, switchyard in large cities, they're automated. There, there's not a lot of people working in those switch yards. Those locomotives are automated. Everything is automated yes. in those switch yards because of the time constraints. Well, and, and, and there's the safety thing, too. And not, not to keep going sideways here, but you... Uh, so Waymo just came out with this statistic, which is the first time that we've actually seen this. And uh, um, the safety stats are incredible Tell you with what, auto, auto, autonomous vehicles. Hold on to that. Uh, and we'll come back to that in just a few minutes because when you start taking a look at uh, the autonomous side of stuff, whether it's rail and look how much uh, oil is shipped by rail and some of the other industrial products that are petroleum produced, 
ship by rail. Uh, now you t- start taking a look at uh, automated uh, what tanker trucks. Uh, there's a whole lot of different places to go with this. More when we come back uh, with Marlo Anderson, our guru of geek. Uh, you can catch him on the Tech Ranch s- uh, Saturday afternoons from 1 until 4 right here on Super Talk. With Steve Bakken as well. Yeah, I might be there occasionally too. Uh, also, uh, The Crude Life, Jason Spees, my co-host on Wattage Wednesday. You can catch him at 10 a.m. Sunday mornings right here on Super Talk 12. Com. Talk of the town. Plato's Closet in West Ashley and North Charleston are springing up cash. Just sell us your gently used warm weather styles like tees, shorts, sandals, and more. We're paying cash on the spot for gently used spring styles for guys and girls. Support sustainable fashion. This spring, do your thing and recycle the spring-inspired clothes, shoes, and accessories that are just hanging in your closet for cash on the spot. Let your spring clothes bloom into cash at Plato's Closet. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Steve Bakken, weekday morning starting at 9 on Super Talk 1270 and the free Super Talk 1270 mobile app. Talk of the Town, brought to you by Big Boy. Just get in line, it moves fast. Dakota Pharmacy and Dakota Natural Health Center. We're here to help you stay well. Trademark Realty, Peak Automotive and Service, and Silver Ranch. Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. You're tuned to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Bach along with Jason Spees from The Crude Life. You can catch Crude Life each and every Sunday morning, 10 a.m. right here on Super Talk 1270. Also, Marlo Anderson, our guru of geek, joining us in the studio this morning. And uh, hi, Marlo. Hello, Steve. Uh, Hello, Jason. Mr. Anderson. Hello. And uh, we're talking about uh, some of the AI stuff that's tied into the energy world. And uh, you were talking about uh, autonomous vehicles and some of the safety numbers. Because if you talk oil and gas and, and energy, coal, all of it, it is safety first. Safety, safety, safety. Yep. That's the number one thing that's preached out there. AI can help in some of that space. Autonomous vehicles, some of the numbers that have come out, because in, in, when you're thinking autonomous vehicles, um, think of uh, what that coal carrier, that, that massive coal truck looks like autonomous. It's in a closed space. Uh, think of what uh, an oil and gas vehicle, look, think about a railroad yard, autonomous. Um, there's a lot of different spaces in different directions that autonomous vehicles play a role today. And we should probably, maybe we just back up just a little bit here. So you and I actually, um, Steve and I anyway, um, got to know each other because of autonomous vehicles. Yeah. What, eight or ten years ago, I suppose? More than that, but you were working on the autonomous corridor That's here correct. in North Dakota. Uh, US 83 That's correct. Uh, was being considered as, how do you turn that into an autonomous corridor for yep. freight? And, uh, and and testing of other autonomous vehicles as well, but that really was the big deal, right? How do we how do we level the playing field for shipping logistics? The cost of it because it's expensive to ship things as out of usual. North you were ahead of your time, and uh, yeah, it, but you know probably, yeah. and and but the one thing that happened from that is that you know I kind of became the poster child for autonomous vehicles in this country for a couple of years. Um, you know, I've re- actually I was thinking more about milk cartons, but I was there too. <laughs> <laughs> wanted yeah um but even even to this day now i'm i'm at 43 different types of self-driving vehicles that i've been in to date wow and pr- probably more than anybody else in the world including flying vehicles including two flying vehicles that's correct and so i've had i've had an interesting and, and i got started down this road because i just you know i was looking at um a good friend of mine uh, and good friend of yours, by the way, uh, daughter was killed in a car accident mm-hmm. around here, you know, eight or nine or 10 years ago now. And, uh, um, I'm just like, you know what? I'm tired of my friends and family dying on our roads. There is a better way. Right. And, uh, and when I was looking at Thomas vehicles at the time, there were stats or, or simulated statistics, I should say, saying that we'd probably have 90% less fatalities, crashes on our roads, right? So this is interesting. So Waymo, which is Google's uh, self-driving vehicles, they have them now. 
um, kind of like Lyft to Uber type of scenarios running in Phoenix and in L.A., um, and some other small pockets in the area. But they have a lot of data that they've put together now. This is interesting. An 85% reduction or 6.8 times lower crash rate involving any injury from minor to severe and fatal cause or cases. So it's 0.41 incidents per million miles for the Waymo driver versus 2.78 for the human benchmark. Wow. 85% reduction. Wow. They have enough numbers now that they can verify that. That's incredible. So we're talking about 40,000 people who die a year on our roads. If we went to autonomous, we'd be probably talking, what, 1,500 a year? It would be so uncommon that when somebody were to die in a car crash, it would make the front page of the newspaper instead of page 8 now. So if you look at um, the big picture, because we hear about, oh, autonomous vehicles and, you know, um, the self-driving cars, Tesla, and, and we only hear about the crashes. That's correct. So because they're uncommon. They're yeah, they're uncommon. You only hear about the crash or or this autonomous Lyft or Uber vehicle got in a car accident, but we don't hear about all of the others that just never happened. So right. uh, there's a little bit of a, a paradigm shift that people are reluctant about. Going, okay, I'm not in control. Like, I, I'm not the one that's and driving that takes, it. That, that that's does, hard. It's hard. That's cultural. And I had I had the same problem with it. You know, the first couple of times, I mean, I'm there's actually a video of me in my first uh, vehicle, and and uh, we almost get into a car accident that the the uh, self driving car avoids. I had never been able to avoid this, but in fact, the engineers in the car doesn't even notice that it's going on, and I'm bracing for impact. <laughs> And instead of instead of going to the left, like you and I would be trained to, we were in eight lanes of traffic, and we were in the second. Actually, we were in the uh, right most lane. That's what it was. And uh, this car just comes to a sudden stop in front of us because a squirrel ran out in front of it or something. I don't know what was going on. And I'm literally bracing for impact. And by the time I had to look left to see if there was an opening, we'd have crashed, right? This self-driving car takes the shoulder, just boom, boom, right around it. The engineer didn't even know it happened. That's how quickly this goes on. And uh, didn't even, I mean, it was just like nothing to him. And I'm just like, oh, my goodness, this is amazing. So, anyway, I've been a big advocate ever since, and it's pretty cool. When we take a look at the evolution of the self-driving cars, do you see it going to commercial first, or do you see it going right to the people because I, I see it actually probably going to semis and those things before you and I can ever set foot in there. So it's a good that's a good question, Jason. I think that uh, um, I think you kind of have to follow the money and also where car or or vehicle manufacturers want things to go. So you have a lot of convergence going on right now because alternate fuels are playing a big role, basically EVs. But there's other other alternate fuels that are emerging, like hydrogen and things like that. And it's easy to put, uh, you know, like self-driving vehicles together with that because people who are early adapters to EVs, for example, are probably earlier adapters to self-driving vehicles. They're just a little more open to these type of things, right? Uh, but you think about um, the driver shortage that we have in trucking right now. So that's where I think you're going to really see a lot of this because, you know, companies can't make money because they can't move products quickly, you know, there's this backlog. So, so the industry is going to look at that and go, hey, you know, will, will a company who would pay a half a million dollars for a semi, I have no idea what they cost. So I'm just making numbers up. Uh, would they pay an extra $100,000 to have a self-driving vehicle and not have to put a driver behind that all the time? The answer to that is probably yes because they're able to actually uh, put more trucks on the road. So that's how I see it going. We're up against a break, but I want to layer that in when we come back on electric vehicles and you know what's coming out of California with some of the standards uh, of electric commercial vehicles and how that plays in. Because I see a, a larger role right now in that last mile component. You talk about railroad all the time, and, and railroad is great for getting it, which are hybrid vehicles. Um, getting that first mile and last mile is the only thing they cannot take care of. Uh, everything else in between, they're great. So when you're looking at that last mile concept of the short distant delivery or pickup, then 
Yeah, I see a great role for that. Uh, when we come back more with Marlo Anderson, our guru of geek, uh, we're talking uh, autonomous vehicles, AI, and all things that play in on the energy side of things with new technology out there. And uh, Jason Spees, you can catch him each and every Sunday morning, 10 a.m., The Crude Life, right here on Super Talk 12 7. Apply. Super Talk. Plato's Closet in West Ashley and North Charleston are springing up cash. Just sell us your gently used warm weather styles like tees, shorts, sandals, and more. We're paying cash on the spot for gently used spring styles for guys and girls. Support sustainable fashion. This spring, do your thing and recycle the spring-inspired clothes, shoes, and accessories that are just hanging in your closet for cash on the spot. Let your spring clothes bloom into cash at Plato's Closet. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Here tuned to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Bach, along with Marlo Anderson, our guru of geek, Jason Spees, my co-host on Wattage Wednesday on Super Talk 1270. You can catch Marlo each and every Tuesday uh, with myself. Also, uh, you can catch him on Saturdays when I do a little tech branch thing the jigger thing from one until four jason spees of course you can catch him on sunday mornings 10 a.m right here with the crude life on super talk 1270 we're talking about the, the intersection of technology and energy and all kinds of cool stuff and um we're talking about autonomous vehicles right now and and you know jason asked a great question uh freight versus people and I'm thinking the freight side of stuff because I, I'm looking at what's coming out of California from the mandates with, okay, you have to have this much of your fleet electric. And you take a look at all the, the products that come out of the West Coast and the port of Long Beach and the different shipping ports on the West Coast and getting them out of there is going to be a constraint. So I'm looking at the commercial side of stuff. I'm also layering in um, kind of by default uh, electric vehicles with the autonomous side of stuff just at least for conversation's sake right now and when you're doing that you're looking at okay i've got constrained distances you're not doing long haul trucking um i can see where it integrates first with railroad because it's that first and last mile concept um i do see a lot of that in the shorter route um and i think that's kind of the, the foothold that autonomous vehicles from a commercial perspective are going to get it's like here you load up the truck and it makes this run and goes and does this route and you're done but it's that short have you ever have you ever been to a shipping yard oh yeah i ran my dad's container company for quite a while have you seen what they're doing with electric vehicles yes i have they're basically they're driverless vehicles you put a shipping container on it and it's programmed to take it to another spot on the shipping yard Simple as that. Yeah, so that then, technology was actually... So I, I ran uh, our container company until 2007. It, my dad was having health problems. Sold it off uh, before the Port of Portland went on strike. Six months ahead of that. that was very, good very call good timing. Yes. Yeah, but they were... Part of the reason that the longshoremen had gone on strike there was... Uh, the port was starting to play with some of the, hey, we don't need as many employees because we've got these autonomous vehicles that yep. we can start to, because they were basing it off of uh, rail shipping yards. And, you know, the autonomous locomotives that were setting up trains and moving cars around and, and they were going down that road of that model a little bit and, and the longshoremen didn't like that idea. It was going to cost jobs. So, again, a little before their time because it was a smaller port. Right. So they were able to to maybe innovate a little bit more without, you know, they could experiment a little bit. And then it just failed miserably because the port shut down. <laughs> Crazy. What you two are talking about is no different than what Amazon is doing right now inside the warehouse. They're just yeah. doing it on a different level. And in fact, McDonald's is now having employee lists uh, service stations popping up now to where they're 24 hours. You can go in and you you do your order yourself and robots cook you your fries and your burger. And it's actually coming out better as far as quality wise than when the humans were involved. And that's why I think that when you see the trucking industry, I think that's going to get hit hard, very fast, very quickly, because what ends up happening, 
when you take a look at any any type of ESG supply chain, for example, right? The environmental social governance supply chain, they're going to start with the environment side. So they're going to be able to say with um, robots taking over for humans, we produce less uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, just like they produce less less deaths on the road okay so we have those type of statistics now to back things up if you go do a google search right now for your airfare it'll tell you your carbon footprint on that air on right. the airline that's exactly uh, right okay yeah so that's what's going to happen now the biggest issue when it comes to trucking companies is how many hours that driver can drive that's like the number one issue and you know good whether they're staying on track or they're they're veering off to the outlet mall quick to get something for their wife, and all of a sudden they get a phone call from a robot saying, "Do you need help getting back on the road?" And in some cases, they they'll turn your vehicle off, and you got to find the nearest off ramp. Well, not off, but they'll put it down to like twenty miles per hour right. or something like that. So, to me, I see the autonomous vehicles going on these certified roads that you're talking about first because it takes the it takes the human element right out just like it did in the shipping yards and just like it did at amazon yep yeah absolutely my two cents so um i think when just to take the Sorry. fear away from people though um and maybe are we talking about this a little more after the top of the hour yeah here? we'll come okay. back to this okay. at the top of the hour because okay. i have and, more and, than this what we can do here so. and that reduction in speeds i already <laughs> no, experienced we're, we're that a lot there guys happy new year yeah <laughs> <laughs> I already experienced that because every time I get too close to the green with my golf cart, oh, yes. yeah, yeah, it's like okay, you're too close, get out of yeah. here. Yeah, that's a, that's a it, great it, example. And you're though. only going to do like a half a mile an hour to get out that of there. That is and so really frustrating. frustrating. By the way. Uh, this is mm-hmm. Talk of the Town, on Super Talk twelve seventy. KLXX AM, Mandan Bismarck, a Town Square media station, broadcasting from the View Community Credit Union Studio. Recorded. ABC World and National News at the top of every hour on Super Talk 1270. Talk of the Town, brought to you by Big Boy. Just get in line, it moves fast. Dakota Pharmacy and Dakota Natural Health Center. We're here to help you stay well. Trademark Realty, Peak Automotive and Service, and Silver Ranch. Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. You're tuned to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Bach along with Jason Spees from The Crude Life. Of course, my co-host each and every Wednesday for Wattage Wednesday. You can catch the Crude Life Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. right here on Super Talk 1270. Also, our guru of geek, Marlo Anderson, joining us in the studio this morning. We're talking uh, a little bit about the intersection of AI, technology, how it plays into the energy sector. We see a lot of that in transportation, uh, uh, where that's going. Um, you take a look at the autonomous vehicles that are out there now. Uh, Jason brought up the the point, you know, take a look at the, what a, a warehouse looks like or an Amazon warehouse or just any major size warehouse, automotive, the autonomous vehicles that work around uh, the automotive industry within that manufacturing plant, coal mines, rail yards, shipping yards, they're already out there. I mean, they're, they're everywhere. Um, now I'm just looking at, okay, scalability. You know, and like I said, it's that first and last mile. Um, that's really the big issue when you take a look at what railroad provides. They've said that forever. And, and railroads, <clears throat> hybrid vehicles. You know, Jason, you know, I, I'm really, there's no limit on where any of this can go. No, it's not. And, and keep in mind, most of this is ESG driven. Now, it might come yeah. under a different name. It might come under a different name. But if it looks like a duck, and it walks like a duck, then you have to document it and send it into the ESG authorities. That's the new way going forward. And I'm very curious on Marlowe's uh, take on what's happening on the other side of things, because we start talking about the human element when it comes to reducing jobs and et cetera, et cetera, through AI. But there's another side of it. We're going to add some jobs. Now, probably not as many as we're going to reduce, but wrong. we are going to add some jobs. <laughs> you are so wrong. Well, it's that, not even funny. And Mar- Well, Marlo, <laughs> we, can, we can debate that at a, at a different date, a different time. Sure. Because um, 
what I see a new emerging market as is what you and I discussed earlier, which is when you do a Google search for your airfare, it tells you what your carbon footprint is. So right. you're going to see a big number, a big shift in these types of software-related jobs, these computer programming jobs, STEM-related jobs. And you know more about that than I, and that's why you very firmly disagreed with me. So talk to me about that emerging market where the jobs are going to come from and how it's going to basically track a carbon footprint or a grid impact, if you will. So the difference is, Marlo, if it looks like a squirrel and walks like a squirrel, then it's a squirrel. Yes. No. (laughs) (laughs) You have to have the squirrel reference. How's that for definitive? Yeah. (laughs) So... I'm not going to say that jobs aren't going to get disrupted because they are. So in the next couple of years, you're going to see probably in the United States because of artificial intelligence, robots, all this stuff coming up that I, I'm, I think uh, the numbers that I've seen is anywhere between 85 and 100 million jobs are going to be disrupted because of this technology. When you think about that, our workforce is about 160 million. So we're talking two thirds of the workforce is going to get disrupted. Okay. But because of this technology, it's going to create another 100 to 120 million new jobs. Um, and a lot of these are just going to be shifts in the companies that you work for. And I'll just pick on, on our large, uh, I'll, well, I'll just pick on Walmart. I don't mean to pick on them directly, but it could be Target. It could be any of them, right? During the pandemic, we were really trained in, you know, when Walmart was a leader in this, in shopping online and getting our stuff delivered, Right. How many people do you know now that that either have their stuff delivered from Walmart or Target or whatever or have it packed? They have pickers now in the stores yeah. that go pick the stuff up and you just go up to lot number 14 in Walmart and get your stuff at 830 in the afternoon. Or it's delivered or you for you and whether it's you see these stores, Walmart, Target, Costco, Sam's Club large sections of the store now dedicated for storing those yes. items that have been picked yes. and and. We all know how valuable that retail floor space is. That has a higher value. When I was in Los Angeles a few weeks ago, I I rolled up to, I I forget what I needed. I think I needed some shampoo for my one hair. And uh, there was three. That's right. Okay. I've, I've grown yeah. a couple back now, okay. if you've noticed. So, and <laughs> and uh, thank goodness for that. The keep stuff. I mean, I put oh, yeah. the keeps on to keep my one like- hair in place, and now I'm starting to grow some back. <laughs> so I'm excited about that. Uh, anyway, um, there was like eight cars in the Walmart parking lot, right? And I walk in there, and I'm like, "Where are all these people coming from?" And then it occurred to me that these are, this is the staff of Walmart picking. So they're not. On, they're not out, um, you know, checking people out anymore. Those same people who were your checkers are now in there picking things. So this is my one example, Jason, of what's going to go on. You're getting disrupted, but you're probably going to still work in the same company, just doing a different gig. Think about the paradigm shift, though, and the cascading effect of what that leads to. So you take a look at a great example. So one of the things I changed when I was mayor of Bismarck was the parking constraints on what do we need for surface lots? Uh, and because it used to be based off of square footage. Well, we don't need all that space. It would drive me nuts when I'd look at different, uh, you know, great example would be up by Willikers in Bismarck and that shopping complex. There should be two more strip malls up there. The big surface parking lots take up so much space. Well, now you're looking to a model like with the pickers and employee parking, how many people actually go to that retail store or just have stuff delivered? So something as simple as parking spaces, do you need that much space? No. No, you don't. The other thing, uh, and I just want to throw this out, is the um, the self-checkout lanes, right? Do yeah. you like, Jason, do you like the self-checkout lanes? I'm mixed on it. Depends on. Um, depends on the line. Depends okay. on my, my mood, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Steve? Do you perform or not? Yeah, they're they're usually quick in and out. Okay. Uh, if, now, there's some things that if I need some help, they're kind of a pain in the butt because it's like you spend time trying to find somebody that's a real checkout. Right. Because if there was something that was marked down, doesn't ring up right, it's like, okay, now what? So this is interesting. Um, they're going to diminish. Guess why? The self-checkout lanes. Yes. They're going to go back. That's correct. Ding, ding, ding. So the shrinkage 
in stores like mm-hmm. like Walmart and Target, four percent. It has more than doubled since self checkout lines have come out, and this is a cost analysis type of scenario again. It'll actually be cheaper for them to actually employ people to check your, you know, because that two percent difference is a huge difference in these stores. When you do a million dollars a day in a store, that's twenty grand that's walking out the door that wouldn't be walking out the door if you didn't have self checkouts. Well, look at a large retail so- checkouts uh, or retail box store, and you're looking at. 200, 250,000 square feet. And the onus in the past has been on the front of the store. Well, it's more expensive to build out that front of store. The warehouse space in the back is actually becoming more valuable, and you're seeing that footprint in the, in the front. Right. You're not storing everything there. It's going to be stored in back. You can have something autonomously pick because you're not going to need all those people going through the store and interacting with the customers because those people are busy doing a different uh, job and then somebody asks them a question hey where can i find this well they may not know they're just following their little scanner that says go here 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 pick that stuff it's a lot easier to do that operation in the back of a store in a warehouse setting and this is what's really interesting about that about that the four percent shrinkage right is that this is in the era of their staff picking groceries and picking items for them the stores are still experiment or experiencing this huge theft issue so the people who are walking in i I don't know what the the theft challenge you know for people who are shopping must be in that eight to ten percent range it's got to be just huge so anyway one of the things i read with that shrinkage study because i'm pretty attuned to the shrinkage thing i used to uh, work at a convenience store where shrinkage was monitored monthly um was a lot of it was people didn't know what they were doing they were that it was unintentional shrinkage on some of these self checkouts as well and um i'd like to continue on this rabbit hole steve i know we're up against the break here but this is a good little rabbit hole yeah we'll talk about that when we come back from the break we're talking with jason's piece uh, along with uh Marlo anderson this is talk of the town on super talk 1270 super talk 1270 Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. When we went You're to tuned to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Bach along with Marlo Anderson, our guru of geek, Jason Spees from The Crude Life. Talking about uh, the intersection of technology and how that plays into energy and what the future might look like a little bit. And Jason, uh, we were talking about something going into the break, but as usual. Shrinkage. Yeah, I try to avoid that word. Oh, that's Just, right. We were yeah. talking about the, uh, the different <laughs> shrinkage and everything. So, so um, had to go yeah, there. Well, we talked about we talked about guilt earlier, so we might as well bring. Why up not? Guilt, right. I mean, let's just have a whole show out of context. It's fun. It's it's the uh, end of the end of the year time. No, but uh, end of well, something. I used to work. Oh, sorry. I used to work at a convenience store, and uh, shrinkage was a big deal. You know, those punk teenagers. And so we had a lot of uh, shrinkage meetings and things along those lines. And what we're talking about is theft. And uh, well, I remember uh, I, I remember the convenience store because I was friends in town I grew up in, and and mm-hmm. the convenience store that was close to, say, a high school or a middle school, and mm-hmm. they would have more theft, but yes. they also had more business. So when, I, I sat down with one of the owners one time and looked through the numbers. I'm like, but percentage-wise, you're still right on par. You're doing a lot more business, but your percentage of theft, yes, you see more theft because of the clientele, but you're not seeing more theft in the overall numbers. The percentages all fit because mm-hmm. stores, they factor in a certain amount of theft as part of their, their loss column. Uh, but so this new, sorry, Steve, but this new theft that kind of has come into the self checkouts is unintentional theft. Mm-hmm. So you're, you know, you're ringing up certain cans and you don't hear the third beep. You know what I mean? You don't hear it, but the right. can goes in. So or you forgot might, the dog food on the bottom shelf of the cart. It, which I've actually done before at Aldi. Actually, I have. That's true. And so this is these things have happened before where you've done unintentional theft. Now, that doesn't make up for the entire, you know, whatever. There are people actually switching stickers and doing all kinds of different things. 
the question I had for Marlo was, I can remember back, oh boy, I was at a different radio station on the east side of the state, and we had Senator Byron Dorgan in at the time, talking about alien technology, how alien technology was making these uh, little smart smart UPCs that could go on all the raised yep. RFIDs, all yep. Yeah, yep. and basically, you would just walk into a store and you'd, you know, have your shopping cart full and you'd walk right out and electronically it would take the money out of your electronic bank account. 15 years ago, when people still use cash, everybody thought we were on planet Pluto, which is no longer a planet, and people no longer use cash. Where are we at in the real world today, Marlo? <laughs> so it's interesting, right? So aliens not around anymore. You know, uh, they were probably a little ahead of their time as well. At least I don't think they're around. They're not in Fargo. I think they got bought out by somebody and moved. So, um, six, they went out of business. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, but RFIDs and, and the plan there was that they were going to make them so that they would cost micro cents per, right? So that you could have them on every product. And then, like you said, uh, Jason, you would just walk through a scanner and uh, it would actually ring up the entire cart at one time. Your entire shopping cart would be rung up immediately. You just give them your credit card or your cash at the time. And that would be that. Right. So scan the chip in your wrist. Yep. Yeah. yep. So that just didn't really like an electronic toll bridge. Really. Yeah. 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 So that yeah. didn't come to fruition for the most part. But the technology is still in wide use and uh but basically more for logistics so when you ship uh let's say you're a wholesaler shipping to walmart right now walmart require these tags to be on the boxes so that when they come into warehouses and whatever it automatically is that way they're used more for inventory at more this point. inventory and my guess would be uh that sometime in the future i would think that ups and fedex and these companies would start embedding them in their boxes as well because you know for a penny or two the the cost savings on labor to scan these things instead of having them hand scanned or whatever they're doing right now when they run through a monitor they could just be scanned to be tracked a lot easier uh somehow or another they're going to start putting those things in there too well, so well, back more up more a step too go. you go back to the warehouse source so you've got amazon that's inventorying all this product they're putting it in so then you just run the scanner over whoever the shipping company is yes so it, you know you're going back to the the beginning the impetus of where that product's coming from so it's not you know they can't afford to put it on every individual product but if it's case lots and, and shipping and things like that it really makes a lot of sense so i think alien was just a little ahead of their time but it's widely you know, used I know, we're, I know we're up against the break here but just to kind of circle back to an esg and technology and these types of rfid chips they were uh, in, at least in emergency services when it came to needles and etc I know they wanted that for safety reasons so they could track, okay, let's just say a, a needle got infected somewhere along the line or something that a scalpel that is reused got infected. They can actually track it through the ESG supply chain, if you will, taking a look at, okay, where where did we see this go wrong? Is that technology still being used? Um, I think this technology can be used in a lot of places. I'm not sure about the tracking of... You know, infected needles or or medical, medical devices. Supplies, yeah, yeah, yep. Um, my guess would be that there's some of that going on, and you know, I'm just going to back you up a little bit, Jason. I, I know that you think you have the same listeners all the time, but that's not true. You should tell everybody what what ESG stands for. Thank you very much. Environmental social governance. Yes, okay. it's in the new uh, alphabet soup of acronyms that we've been introduced to in the last two years. Well, but yes. it, 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 it was kind of a big deal two years ago, and then it kind of went away, and now it's coming back again because carbon sequestration was kind of the flavor over this last year, and ESG is now coming back, and it, it, it's really fluid on everything that's going on. Um, you know, you bring up a great example, though, on the medical supplies. Think about food food security, um, salmonella outbreaks. Sure. A and you're looking at, okay, the work and time and effort that goes into a recall trying to track down where a salmonella outbreak came from or, um, you know, the applesauce with babies right now and the lead poisoning. And if you've got those lots and that shipping and it's all tracked, 
through this technology, it, it's a lot easier to find that source of where that malady may come from. And and think the other thing with this type of technologies too is that you have to think about again. I always chase the money, so is there cost savings with this? Well, if you add two cents, recording to, in progress. If you add uh, two cents to the to the cost of a package, but you save a dollar <laughs> in the cost of the logistics to move it around. You saved a lot of money, which actually saves consumers right. money. And I always point, technology always seems to be expensive right away, but it actually saves you money a lot of times as you move forward. Think of the cost again of a 65 inch television that used to cost $20,000, not that many years ago. And I just bought one over the Christmas sales at $238. Holy is that crazy? And that was not on one of your little shipping no. pallets. But 238 bucks for a 65-inch television? Are wow. you kidding me? I remember buying a 19-inch television when I got out of high school, and I had to make payments on it. By, by the way, was that a smart TV? It was a smart TV. For 230 Yeah, Roku, all wow. the LG channels, all of it. It's crazy. Unbelievable. Waffles and everything. <laughs> what? I didn't Bre- know this. Breakfast in bed, Does yeah. it have a maple oh. syrup dispenser as well? Oh, my goodness. Wi-Fi waffles, man. Those are the best. <laughs> Marlo, our giant elf. Him and his maple syrup. I love uh, maple syrup. <laughs> so good on spaghetti. Syrup. Smart syrup, yes, and Wi-Fi waffles. Marlo, it's been fun. Uh, Sarah Stogner coming up next. Uh, this is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 12. News. Hey, guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money. Right now. Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. For Bismarck Mandan, Super Talk 1270. Talk of the Town, brought to you by Big Boy. Just get in line, it moves fast. Dakota Pharmacy and Dakota Natural Health Center. We're here to help you stay well. Trademark Realty, Peak Automotive and Service, and Silver Ranch. Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. You're tuned to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Buying along with Jason Spies from The Crude Life. You can catch Crude Life Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. right here on Super Talk 1270. Also, Sarah Stogner, the unicorn lawyer, joining us now. And uh, we're going to talk, uh, before we get into our private public picks, we're going to talk about the no-fly zone. And no, we're not talking about the Philadelphia Eagles no-fly zone because they've lost three in a row now. Um, we're going to talk... <laughs> Sorry, I'm picking on the Eagles. I don't like them as fans. Um, but uh, no fly zone. Sarah, explain this to us. Uh, there's a no fly zone for drones down in Texas. It's there's a no fly zone for all aircraft up to three thousand feet across a, a, near a new blowout. The last time this happened was January 2022, and they got a no fly zone where the railroad commission goes to the FAA and says, "Hey." there's a danger to people or whatever because of the potential like if a football game for example right you'll get a no fly zone over a crowded stadium because they don't want all these drones around this big show right um but they listed leaking gas and then cbs 7 came out yesterday and did a, a piece on it and the railroad commission told them that there's been no sign of any toxic substances but it's leaking fully saturated brine it looks just like Beamer Lake, all the stuff that we've been seeing with this produced water that's making its way to surface. And now it's broached outside of a wellbore, which means it's found its way to surface through cracks in the earth, natural or man-made. And uh, there's no well to rig up on to, to actually stop it. Okay, where I have a... So concern- I'm looking at a story. Hang on here, Steve. I'm looking yeah. at a story from the uh, local paper, the Midland uh, I think it's Reporter Telegraph or something like that. And actually, they're rerunning it from the Houston Chronicle. So I know you've had a number of media outlets out there, but there you are, your picture of you with your unicorn uh, lawyer duds on, which is, you know, basically looks like you're coming off a shift at the coal mine. Um, okay, so Sarah Stogner here is being discussed in the article. And what we're talking about here is 
salt water, sir. Explain to what's happening what, and, and how, how are you involved? <laughs> well, I'm involved because I've been a vocal critic, right, of the Railroad Commission um, and live on a ranch where we're excavating. I did notice that's what your title was in the story. That's what your title was in the story, vocal critic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go on. <laughs> and um, and so uh, what, what we think is we don't know because we're not getting any information, but based on information received to date and common sense, we think that there is an over-injection of produced water. And produced water is a nice term for the nasty salt water that comes up with oil and gas. Because people don't understand when you drill and complete a well, water comes up with that oil and gas. And the older a well gets, the more water ratio comes up. And so out here, we call it washing rock. In a lot of situations, it'll get up to like 100 barrels of water for every one bar- barrel of oil, Right. And then they re-inject it. Sometimes they re-inject it into a different zone to dispose of it. Sometimes on vertical drills, which are the old drills that you see that didn't go horizontal, they would re-inject it into the same formation to keep up the pressure and help make the the more oil come out because oil floats on top of water. Um, But now with fracking, the reason you have to frack is because it doesn't have the permeability. It doesn't have the ability to get through the rock. And so you can't inject the water back into that. It basically looks like cement down there, right? Limestone, whatever. And um, yeah, so now we got to put this water somewhere and we're under reporting it. But uh, even under reporting it, there's 19 million barrels a day that are injected in Texas every day. So my question is, is why would a flight restriction matter? What's the advantage or disadvantage? What, what, <laughs> well, they why don't would... like yeah, they don't like me publicizing it. So if I can't see it, I, I don't know exactly what's going on. But yesterday morning when I went with the news, there was a rig out there. There's a couple offset wells near where it broached its surface um, that they're trying to rig up on. And we thought it was listing a little bit to the right. And they rigged down. And then this morning they were rigging back up after they got all the equipment off. So it's close enough to the highway for us to be able to see. But... Yep, that's that's what we're doing. Well, the first thing I think of when I think of a, a listing rig is, okay, subsurface, you're not on stable ground. And, okay, what's the extent of that leak at that point? There's so many other questions when you start talking about uh, that reinjection and then, um, you know, the natural cracking. And I, where my mind goes right now is what's going on in North Dakota with the sequestration stuff on CO2. There's a lot of different ways to go with that. And a uh, s- story we're going to follow, and uh, we'll get an update next week. Uh, Sarah Stogner, the unicorn lawyer down in Texas. I'm Steve Bakken, along with Jason Spees from The Crude Life. When we come back, our private public picks on Super Talk 12 7. Hey guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. <laughs> Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. You're tuned to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. I'm Steve Bogan along with Jason Spees from The Crude Life. You can catch Crude Life Sunday mornings 10 a.m. right here on Super Talk 1270. Uh, also, Sarah Stogner, she is the unicorn lawyer from down in Texas. And uh, it is time for our private public picks. And are we ready? Is that is that we're just handing? And off, ready to go. No chit chat. Let's get right. No, to let's her. get right, right to it. Yeah, let's go to our Thursday game here. Prime Video, seven fifteen Central Time. The six and nine Jets without Zach Wilson, who is yet to clear concussion protocol, taking on the ten and five Browns. Mathematically, still could be the number one seed. Browns. I'm going Cleveland as well. That uh, defense travels when they're at home. Jump on the fanatical Flacco bandwagon, baby. All right. And by the way, the Minnesota Vikings could have had Flacco. All right. Let's go with the 11 and 4 Motor City Kitties, the Detroit Lions, the winner of the NFC North, taking on the Dallas Cowboys 10 and 5 at the Cowboys. 
I'm going to go Cowboys on this one. I think they're still fighting for something. Yeah, we're not sure what, though. Uh, they, after last week. But, again, they don't play well on the road. They play well at home. Uh, Dallas at home. Detroit, they wrapped up their division. I think they're going to have a little bit of a step back, especially on the road. Going with the Cowboys at home. And that's a New Year's Eve game. Seven fifteen start time. Now let's go to Christmas Eve. Sorry, uh, New Year's Eve, Sunday, New Year's Eve here. That was the Eve Eve game before Saturday game. Got my days mixed up. All right, the eleven and four Dolphins at the twelve and three Ravens. Oh, CBS is going to have the game of the week here. Ravens. I'm going Baltimore. They're legit. Going to go with the Dolphins with an upset. On the All road. Right. The wow. Four, excuse me here, the red hot 4-11 and 11 Patriots <laughs> off that one-game win streak over Denver, Brutal. taking on the 9-6 and six Bills at the Bills. Uh, Bills. I'm going Buffalo. This is not a trap game for Buffalo, and Buffalo found a running game, so they're legit now. Patriots are going to be riding too high off that victory in mile high. We got to go with the Bills. So let's go with the seven and eight Falcons at the six and nine Bears. Oh man, I have no idea on this one. Honestly, I, I, I think I'm going to go Bears though at home. I'm going Bears because they do have a lot to play for, not uh, necessarily within the division or the playoffs, but they're playing for who's still going to have a job next year. A bear will always eat a falcon, so we got to go with the bears. Uh, let's go with the five and ten tight. You like that logic? Let's go with the five and ten Titans at the eight and seven Texans. Texans. Uh, Houston on that one, yeah. Titans with an upset on the uh, who wins? Okay, does let's go titan, with the. Does a titan eat a Texan or a Texan eat a titan? <laughs> The Titan would step on the Texan. I know everything's bigger in Texan, Texas, but a Titan is one of the few giants by nature. So a, I think a they'd Titan be too would slow, stomp though. on a Texan. <laughs> that, that could be. That could be. Uh, and and see, actually, see, the and, seven and eight. And, and, and yes. actually, that's Go ahead. the Houston Bowl. Because Tennessee is the former Houston Oilers. You're correct. You're right. I, in fact, a better way to phrase it is the artists formerly known as the Oilers <laughs> yes. taking on the Houston Texans. Yes, that would have been the better way to phrase that. All right. So the artists formerly known as the Oakland Raiders, Los Angeles Raiders, Oakland Raiders, and now the Las Vegas Raiders. I think I have every one of those right. Taking on the eight and seven Colts at the Colts. Um, I think Vegas. Minshew Mania, baby, Indianapolis. I got to go with the Las Vegas Raiders on this one. For some reason, Carson Wentz still has cursed the Colts, and they implode when playoff time comes around. So let's go to the next game, the 2-13 and 13 Panthers at the 8-7 and seven Jaguars. Jaguars. I don't think the Panthers could beat a high school team right now, honestly. Jacksonville. Boy, I tell you what, Tony Khan, the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars, is really fixated on his pro wrestling AEW. So I'm going to go with the Panthers with the upset. He's too focused on pro wrestling. He's ignoring his pro football team. Panthers are going to win. All right, let's go with, how's that for logic there? Mm -hmm. The 8-7 and seven Rams at the 5-10 and 10 Giants who just benched. Mr. Danny DeVito, pizzeria guy. Rams. <laughs> Rams. We're going with the Rams on that as well. All right, the 3-12 and 12 Cardinals at the 11-4 and 4 Eagles. 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 Eagles with the sweep. 7-8 and eight Saints at the 8-7 and seven Buccaneers. Do it. Do it. Saints. Do yeah. it. I dare you. Do it. <laughs> 
She did. She who hotted <laughs> Baker Mayfield. Uh, he's it, it's a different Baker Mayfield. Uh, Tampa Bay making the playoffs. Going to be a dangerous team. I I would take them over Dallas. Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay. Baker Mayfield. If he makes the Super Bowl, gets four million extra. Fails. Benjamins. All right. Got the eleven and four Forty Nine ers at the four and eleven Commanders. 49ers. San Francisco is going to be PO'd. It is going to be a route San Francisco. <clears throat> San Francisco may set the scoring record on Sunday. Okay, let's go with the 8 and 7 Steelers at the 8 and 7 Seahawks. I think the Seahawks. Seattle. Seattle. 5 and 10 Chargers at the 7 and 8 Broncos. Broncos. Broncos, I, I'm not confident. Of Easton that. Stick and the Chargers with an upset. All right, let's go with the seven and eight Bengals at the nine and six Chiefs. Chiefs, Chiefs, the dysfunctional Chiefs. And I'm going to go with the Chiefs as well. They're going to turn it around here. So with the last game, New Year's Eve, seven twenty, all the world is going to be watching the seven and eight Packers at the seven and eight Minnesota Vikings. Packers. Well, I don't know. This this is what's Minnesota playing for? What's Green Bay playing for? I dysfunction, dysfunction, dysfunction. Green Bay is actually getting a little less dysfunction, but I'm going to go Minnesota just because my heart bleeds purple. The Packers will win. The Vikings are going to start their third string quarterback from BYU. I forget his name, and that's why the Packers are going to win. With that, I hand it back to you, Steve. I think they're all third string quarterbacks at this point. I don't know who's. Left. I don't know who you would call should, a second string quarterback. Me, they're going to hand it off to their sixth string. Yeah, quarterback. sixth string. It, it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> I just hope they draft the quarterback out of Florida State and re-sign Kirk Cousins. That's all I hope for. Uh, our private public pick: Sarah Stogner, Jason Spees. You can catch Jason with the Crude Life uh, Sunday mornings, ten a.m. This has been Talk of the Town on a Wattage Wednesday on Super Talk, twelve seventy. LXX AM, Mandan Bismarck, a Town Square media station, broadcasting from the View Community Credit Union Studio. Plato's Closet in West Ashley and North Charleston are springing up cash. Just sell us your gently used warm weather styles like tees, shorts, sandals, and more. We're paying cash on the spot for gently used spring styles for guys and girls. Support sustainable fashion. This spring, do your thing and recycle the spring-inspired clothes, shoes, and accessories that are just hanging in your closet for cash on the spot. Let your spring clothes bloom into cash at Plato's Closet. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue.